great achievement in Nari who won the Derby. Philly man winning the Derby, so we're very proud of that. Did you bring some holy water to give a blessing for the books? Oh, I didn't. Well, I said the horses now all for the books, maybe, yeah. <laughs> First of all, welcome everyone to Strand Road and Cairns Randleys. Uh, thanks, Stephen, for making the very hard decision to, to launch your book in the Hallow Ground. <laughs> Or as you refer to us, the crowd from the other side of town. <laughs> um, so um, Bernard, Bernard is um, a, spry, a surprise to some of us in Strand Road, but not surprising. Um, he's not alone in, in great sportsmen from Strand Road that went on to international fame. Um, we have 500 yards up the road, Cairns Park, we have Christy Switzer who um, represented Ireland at weightlifting. Um, just like the place there. Um, just 20 yards across the road, we have the Springs House, Donal and Dick represented Ireland uh, in rugby. Um, 300 yards up towards Ball Road, John Griffin represented Ireland in athletics, and indeed his brother um, uh, represented Ireland as a cyclist. So Bernard is not alone, we're delighted to hear about him. Um, He's, um, thanks again to Stephen for bringing him home, but, and he's not alone. Um, I'd be interested to read the book, so if anyone bought it, I'd borrow it after. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be very interested in seeing what Stephen has to say about Strand Road. Um, I'm sure he'll um, only speak very well of us, as he always does, sometimes. <laughs> um, so lads, welcome, welcome to Strand Road. Stephen, best luck with the book. Uh, I will borrow it off someone, and everyone enjoy their night. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Oliver. Uh, my job is very easy tonight because the next man really, literally, does not need uh, any introduction. Uh, Councillor Terry O'Brien is the mayor of Tralee. He's also the last career look of Kerry County Council. Um, in addition to his fantastic work as a public representative over the years, Terry has championed many, many worthwhile causes. He's worked tirelessly for the Irish Wheelchair Association. And um, also, in addition to those many distinctions, I was doing a bit of research on him uh, before tonight, and I discovered he described himself, and I'm sorry, Terry, if I'm going to embarrass you, he described himself to an interviewer once as a thoroughbred nari. <laughs> Bernard Dillon was a Nari, and I'm, I'm sure he, he wrote a few thoroughbreds in his time. So there literally is no better man to launch the life and times of Bernard Dillon. Please uh, give a very, very warm round of applause to the Mayor of Tralee, Terry O'Brien. She said, no, it's coming there, I'm nervous. Um, maybe uh, Minister Foy, um, Sean Kelly. Uh, councillors and wannabe councillors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in this upcoming election, oh, so I want to speak, sorry, so I promise I won't. I'm not going to mention politics, but I must say, about six weeks we had a phone call from Stephen, and uh, Eddie was with you with Stephen regularly. When you see Stephen, they was, what's after happening now? He's looking for a quote. And 
something. But he was so nice, he said, Terry, I, I really like it, you launched my book, and I was thrilled and honored him. And he called Dave, and I think we need a register, and I said, <laughs> Anyway, I realized this week that that's why, and it's the last night before the election, so most of the candidates are on canvas saying, and Stephen has me tied in here. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst part is he can't even vote because he's on the other side of the board. <laughs> Anyways, welcome all. Um, I think Albert touched on it. This is um, General the Hall of Football and Kerry Rooney. Uh, Stephen is half an array. He doesn't he doesn't hold his hand up with, but he is half an array. No, he's obviously written a book about it, so he now knows where the real street of champions is. Because he knows the the street of champions. Uh, look, and being being a strand of I suppose really. Martin and I give gifts for Christmas, maybe a half an alley, half a rocky jersey. I'd say you love that, you will have a pride. Um, it's a fascinating story, this book, and uh, I love the subtitle, The Nari Who, the Nari Who and the Derby. Uh, so, and it is a really great evening for, for the Nari's. Uh, it's a fantastic achievement and a fantastic book. Uh, ultimately, the story of a boy from Tralee who made it to the top. And it's a story of someone who most of us would have been aware, unaware of until Stephen brought this story to life. When you think of what Bernard did and achieved, it makes you realize how significant those achievements were. To have come from humble roots here in the best part of Tralee Town to winning the Epsom Derby is truly remarkable. And thanks to his new book, his story will now be remembered forevermore. But the great thing about this book is it's not just the story of a tragedy, as it's the story of success. And Stephen captures very well how Dylan had his own personal problems and difficulties throughout his life, not least through his addictions and his relationship with Mary Light. That uh, Bernard excelled in the sport he loved, but could never shake the inner demons that haunted him so profoundly in later life produces a story of individual fame framed by an intense and at times unbearable sadness. It is a reminder that success often brings its own challenges. Stephen, as we all know, is a gifted journalist. He's also a gifted writer. And I think this book does great justice to his research and writing abilities. Um, those of us in Kerry County Council, those of us in Kerry County Council, we, um, we see where the journalists sit. And for those of you who don't know, the chamber is mostly made up of councillors who talk. So much intelligence and so much sense most of the time. And the journalists sit on one corner, they usually sit there and they'll be stretched across the seats and heads down and look at their phones and so on. But there was one particular event there in 2016, I was there. And uh, we decided to hold a civic reception. So my phone was ringing the week beforehand. It was important that he got the seat and it was important he was in there. I said, Jesus, very enthusiastic about it, Stephen. And uh, I must say now, uh, looking at the journalist uh, section that night, he was sitting up like a turkey cock. He was fully involved because there was a it was a civic reception we gave to Brian Cooper after winning the, the, the Gold Cup. <laughs> I'm not joking, he was first in, he was around everyone, and he was last out. I think he actually got into the car with you, man, the Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, Steve for a while, turn over there. Um, that just like that, thank you very much. Um, I don't really have a candidate, I'm just saying. Just saying. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. But by being friends with Stephen Irwin and friends with social media, you know, uh, we often exchange stories and exchange uh, you know, bits and pieces going on. And if, you, if you go to Stephen's social media, talk about a mix. Uh, the New York Jets. Now, any Irish that went to America, it was either a Chicago who followed Bears or New York who followed the Giants. You know, man, it's like following each of in the Irish football. <laughs> 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 Now he has the glass house, he grows his own food. It's only food, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He told me it's only food, that's all. There's three years of the past. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he's now, it's a great mention, and my 17th level love for Manchester United for our penance. But everything goes back to horse racing. So I was flicking through it yesterday, so I have to look at these again. So, so many headings. Just the first heading I got yesterday was me time. I thought, fair choose them. He's outside, barefoot and banner, walking back and back, you know, and then. No, the body of it was the Clammy Races. <laughs> uh, me on a week off was the heading. I said, Fair Houston, he's taking her to Paris. The Eiffel Tower? No, Cheltenham. <laughs> RIP. I said, Ooh, politician, better keep an eye on this. I might know this person, you know. Hardly useless, the horse. <laughs> uh, 
the next one was, you would almost forget how good he was. I said, Jesus, David Morgan is maybe Tommy Walsh. At Cato Star. I often think of when um, I see a friend called Tommy here, he, he told a story at his uh, late brother Tom's funeral there recently, and actually, it was funny, the day I even thought of um, Stephen, because there's, there's, there's a couple of public houses in the town, and they have a famous painting of the Magnificent Seven. And, you know, after a few pints, fell it's like it, and I went in there trying to name who the, who the actors were in the, the arguments of Wood, Bremer, and Charles Bronson, and Steve McQueen, and back and forth, like every seven. But one of these nights, I'm going to go up to Van Lang Sunday, and I guarantee you, he won't name the actors, but he'll name every horse in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is a book which will fill a void in the history of Trudy, um, and the horse racing uh, in this period. I know it will do well, and it's already selling well, I saw that tonight. Um, one, there was a comment there about uh, Stephen attacking the club. Again, back to his journalistic there. If he didn't turn up tonight, God knows what he'd say about you. Everyone knows. Uh, it is great to be here tonight. Uh, Stephen, I'm honoured to, to, um, to launch this video and to see um, how successful it's going to be. So uh, you have done a nary uh, great justice. Uh, congratulations, and you now may consider this book officially launched. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, uh, just before I, I introduce the, the man in a moment, uh, just a few thank yous on our, on our behalf as well. Uh, thank you to um, uh, Parvati, who couldn't be here today, who, who, who our book designer. Uh, actually, when Stephen came to me originally, he really wanted both the cover and the interior to have a bit of an antique flavor, to give it that Edwardian atmosphere as a tribute to Bernard Dillon, and I think she really achieved that, both in the the cover art and the book interior. Also, thank you to Sarah Mina Callahan, my very much my right hand woman, who's who's really um, did so much tirelessly work to, to build the business. Um, I, all of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with Stephen as a journalist, uh, myself included. Um, you know, he, he has a wide range of interests. He writes very well on politics, as as Terry outlined. Uh, local journalism is really important. In my opinion, it's essential. You can't have functioning local government if you don't have people like Stephen to hold government to account. I know, Stephen, it's uh, maybe it's an irony that a lot of politicians here uh, tonight, and that's a good thing. The foxes and the hounds are, are together uh, in one room. Um, but uh, remarkably, look, Stephen's interest isn't just politics either, even though he's a foreign politics. English and journalism grad from University College Cork. He's, uh, one of his passions as a journalist is human interest stories. And I think um, it's very fitting his first book is a history of Bernard Dillon because you can't really get more of a human interest story than the book you have in front of you. Um, it's a very, very human story. And I'm gonna um, please get around the applause to Stephen. He's gonna tell you all about it. You're all very welcome to Strand Road, and it's a line I never thought I'd hear myself saying. <laughs> Life has a habit of putting you in strange situations, I guess. Uh, no, first of all, just a couple of thank yous. Each and every one of you, thank you so much for coming out here this evening. I really appreciate it, taking time out on a Thursday night to listen to a great talk about a jockey who's 100 years old. You know, so thank you so much for that. Um, also, just to thank Jeremy for all his work in publishing this. Uh, you, you know, when you spend two years writing and researching something, uh, you become a bit obsessive with it to say the least, and you become very protective of it. So to hand it over to somebody that carried up that same care and sensitivity, I was very much appreciated because the design of the book I love, there's a fierce Edwardian team running through the book, and I think the publication kind of captures that. You see that probably throughout it's a nice antiquated feel to it. So thanks Jeremy and his team. Um, Mr. Terry O'Brien, uh, the mayor of Chile, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think it's very fitting that this book should be published at the same time that Terry is mayor of Chile. Um, I, that's, that's written in the stars, I think, because for something with Nari in the title and to have who I consider one of the proudest Naris in the planet launching it, I think it's very fitting. And I've known Terry way before books about politics or way before or books about jockeys or before politics. So, you know, he's a good friend of mine. We go way back and I want to thank him so much for, for being here this evening. He's definitely one of the good guys to have. Um, 
um, a quick word of thanks as well to the club here, Kearns O'Reilly's, uh, Oliver Malloy, Patrick Lavin, Danny Lee. Um, I will say, you guys, from the minute this was pitched, you got behind it 110%. And I think it says something about the calibre of this club um, that you guys recognised straight away that this was one of your own. Bernard was the son of Strand Road, and I think you guys bought it that immediately. So I think that's credit to you, and thank you so much for, for buying into it, and that's so, so important to me. Um, Years of family have just left. They've just left here. The Ukrainian musicians. I just want to pay, pay mention to them. Um, that was sprung on me yesterday evening. It was such a lovely surprise because I had written a lot about their story since they came to Ireland a couple of years ago. And she, all you rang last night to say it was a thank you gesture to play here this evening for covering their story since they came here. And that completely elevated this evening, no doubt, on a personal level for me. So I just want to thank them very much for that. And I know it's a sort of bittersweet friendship. We'd, we'd rather not be friends because if that was the case, they'd be at home in peace and they wouldn't be here, but they're very much part of our community now and they're making a great contribution and we welcome them and thank them. Um, as for Bernard Dillon, oh, just a few thank yous as well. There's a few down there. I won't name you in case I miss, miss a name because you, you'll kill me uh, for editing and, and helping me out at the early stages of, of this book. Um, especially my wife, my really patient wife. Um, she got all, she, she had the best job because she got all the best ideas from me and she had to take them all on board. But there, there were times she told me where to put the book and it wasn't in a bookshelf, I can tell you. <laughs> so just thanks to her as well. Um, as for this guy here, Bernard Dillon, I mean, you could be here for a year and a day and you still wouldn't get to the end of this guy. Uh, he's one of the most fascinating characters I've ever I've ever encountered in my time reading or listening or watching racing. Um, it's very significant as well just to mention the reason we're here tonight. As a matter of fact, it's very important to mention why we're here tonight. Um, Burnham was born, I calculated, literally, literally 50 yards from where we're gathered here this evening in Carolina. Um, just outside what was O'Sullivan's shop, there was a coach service that would take people to the railway station and their luggage. And in 1901, at the age of 13, um, Bernard, still wearing shop pants in January 1901, he boarded that carriage with his luggage and he left for Salisbury in England uh, to be a jockey like his older brother Joe. Um, well, you can imagine a young guy that age taking the boat, first time boat actually, taking the boat across to England, arriving at Waterloo Station in London, all the noise and the clamour and everything that went with it. And to think within a few years he was one of the best writers of the flat scene in England, uh, it's quite remarkable. And I think that's why it's very significant because why, when I had this book written, it was, it was a no-brainer as to where the book would be launched, really. There was no place else in Tralee but Strand Road where this book was going to be launched. And I think it's, without getting too kind of sentimental about it, it's, it feels like I'm bringing Bernard home tonight to relaunch his story and where it all started. He would have written his horses right where his clubhouse is. And I think that's hugely significant for me, having having done the writing, but to have this sort of a, you know, a sentimental send off for, for the book as well is, is very important. Um, just to give some context about Bernard, I mean, there's definitely two sides to him. He was a, a, an immensely talented jockey, but also a very flawed individual. I described him recently as as charismatic, um, but he was also as talented as he was flawed. You know, that's that's how you could describe him. But. For, just to give it a racing context, um, he arrived in 1901, and within four or five years, he was the best, one of the best jockeys. Now, at that time in England, in the flat scene, a lot of the great American riders like Danny Marr and Todd Sloan and all the trainers were coming over to England. They were taking the, the game by storm there. I think the, the finishing times in the Epsom Derby increased by about four or five seconds just for the way the American trainers were training their horses. It was completely different. And the style of riding as well was completely different. The American riders were way ahead of their time. They were like the, the modern day flat jockeys today, the way they rode. So they really, it was really a changing environment that Bernard Dillon arrived in. And to think that you know a, a whippersnapper from across the street here within four or five years in England was the equal of these guys, if not their better, it's 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 quite quite a remarkable achievement. And I think his breakthrough came in 1906 when he won the 1,000 guineas on a filly named Flair. Now, if you follow your race and you know that 1,000 guineas is still a very prestigious race. It's the early, earliest classic race for three-year-old fillies in England, and it still is a very prestigious race. That was his first kind of breakthrough, and he won it twice, but 1906 was, was the breakthrough. 
Um, he went to Paris 11 days later, oh, sorry, in the summer of 1906, he went to Paris and he won the Grand Prix de Paris on a horse called Spearmint. And that was really the, the moment that he was announced on the scene because that horse had won the Epsom Derby 11 days earlier with Danny Meyer riding him. So Danny Meyer got jobbed off for this young whippersnapper from Stranraer and that uh, Bernard went to Paris on a sweltering hot day and won the Grand Prix de Paris and that was it. After that he was he was known worldwide. And there's a chapter in the book as well that he gave two interviews around that time, 1906 and 1907, and uh, the one of them was for Bernard Parsons around the clock with a jockey, a day in the life of a jockey, sorry, and that really kind of symbolized that the content is ordinary enough, you know, he talks about my, his weight and things like that, and, but, but what's significant about the interviews, he gives one in England and one in America, and I think it's, it's a pure indication that Bernard had arrived in both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, you know, that he was that popular jockey, he was no longer the apprentice. And um, I suppose the high point came in 1910, when he won the Epsom Derby. Um, now, outside of the Chetland Gold Cup, which is my favorite race, and I'm delighted to see Tom here tonight, his son had the honor of winning that race a couple of years ago. That to me is the pinnacle of horse racing. But the second race I would hold up would be the Epsom Derby. It's one of the oldest classics. And that to me would be a very, very prestigious race. So when he won that in 1910, um, he was like a celebrity. People wanted to go to the bars with him, the restaurants and what so. Uh, he, he had no objections going to the bars, I can tell you, you should see in the book. But um, that was sort of his high point. And his relationship with Mary Lloyd, who I mentioned a bit later, was kind of was kind of coming to the fore at that stage as well. But, to win the Epsom Derby at that stage uh, was a remarkable achievement. Um, you know, I mean, I just carry myself to a talk there that Strenwell actually won an Epsom Derby before they won the county championship. <laughs> and Terry, Terry said to me, there's every chance they'll win the Epsom Derby again before they win the county championship. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, that was his high point. And I think his career, I, I said it some, to someone recently, his, his finest hour was also sort of his 11th hour because he went downhill rapidly after that. And uh, I'm not going to go too much into it, you, know, you can see it for yourself, but I just want to get a bit to Mary Lloyd. She was an incredibly famous uh, music hall artist in England at the time. Um, she still is very famous, and she was 18 years old from Bernard, and she was twice married when she met him. So you can imagine the scandal in Edwardian England, this young jockey and this famous star, uh, twice married. and. So that kind of they kind of went off in a, in a media spin, and they went to there's a great chapter on Ellis Island. They went to America in 1913, and they, they were incarcerated in Ellis Island because they weren't married. And if you can just picture the scene, two of the most famous and wealthiest people in Edwardian England, with hundreds of immigrants that have arrived that day, it's it's just an amazing scene. Like, and there's so much colour around it. And I should I should have mentioned at the outset as well, Bernard thankfully wrote a memoir. Um, in 1922 for the local papers in Britain. Now, again, this is where it comes full circle to the Kerryman. That's, it's very hard to find it in its totality in the British newspaper archives. You can get segments of it, but you can't find it from A to B. But thankfully, the editor in 1923 in the Kerryman saw fit to serialize the entire um, memoir of Brother Dillon. So I spent a year just reading over that and familiarizing myself with it. And I was able to build a story then with secondary sources and from old racing books. So, the Kerryman has, has a big part in this as well. Um, what's significant about that as well is that no one had given Bernard a voice until now, and I say that categories with, with fact. Um, Mary Light had six biographies written about her since 1922, and while they, they reference Bernard uh, uh, naturally enough of them, they don't really tell Bernard's story, or they kind of, it's sort of incidental as an aside. So that didn't really sit with me, and I wanted to kind of give Bernard his own voice back, so that was another reason why I went at the book. But, um, there's a great chapter as well on the war when he, he, he did everything to, to, to not fight in the, first, in the First World War. I mean, he, he was arrested more times in London for fighting during those years than he was. And, and, and he, he was finally shipped out in 1918 to the machine gun corps in Mesopotamia, to where he was stationed. And uh, the, he, he was arrested the night before for hitting a waiter with a soda water bottle in a restaurant. And it was his fourth defense that within six months at that time and he was just about to be sentenced by the judge when a telegram came through that he was to report back to the machine gun corps that they were being shipped out in the morning and the judge said that he was delighted that Bernard Dillon, that Dillon was finally going to a place where violence was permitted so that gave you a sense of his reputation in London.
But his, his demise, and I, I kind of finish on this bit, his demise was, was sad, I mean, it was tragic, and it was dark. I mean, he was no angel by any means, and I'm not painting him as a hero here, and you'll see for yourself why that's the case. Alcohol didn't suit him. Um, he, he was, you know, he was very abusive, violent, in fact, and I think in the years that passed, his reputation sort of, sort of kind of dissipated, and, you know, the name was there, but I think the demeanor and the... The sort of like his reputation was only hanging in there, and I just I just close out with a small bit from the book here that kind of captures that. Uh, he goes to Cheltenham, surprisingly. He loved jump racing, by the way. He spent his time back in Cockle Shell and the bank, jumping over uh, stone walls and ditches and things. So, as, as a jump racing fan, I think we'll claim him first. But I just read you a little bit here that kind of gives you an, an idea of his demise. Uh, sometime in later in life, Bernard attended a day's racing at Cheltenham. Even though the peak of his best years had passed and his youthful features consigned to the memory of summer days as the rarest flat jockey of his age, he kept a keen eye on jump racing's greatest show on the Cotswolds. Since riding his black cob as a boy over the stone wall and the ditches around Tralee, more than ever, horses had come to define his existence within social circles as he aged. Wrapped in his warm coat and hat, Bernard's extra weight insulated him from the cold wind that swept in from Cleve Hill in a way it could never do when riding light as a feather. He strolled among the large Cheltenham crowd, content in the atmosphere he knew best. The regular racing aficionados of Cheltenham would have instantly recognised the 1910 Derby hero and shook hands. He was at ease standing on the packed terraces with the tobacco smell casting a cloud over the den of excitement. He was staying at one of the town's busy hotels for the races, and it was here that a conversation with a woman proved that his once handsome features were no longer recognisable. At the same time, his demeanour certainly did not prevent his name from dropping whenever debates about the great jockeys came up for discussion. The woman was obviously a turf devotee, and before long they considered which of the great jockeys they knew. Bernard recalls the conversation. And do you know Bernard Dillon at last, she asked. Well, yes, I know him fairly well. Well, you do, do you, said she. And there Bob opened her mouth to let it say precisely what it liked. What it liked to say was not too pleasant either. But do you know him, I managed to ask when she paused for breath. Oh yes, she made answer. I have known the scoundrel for years. There ensued some desultory conversation, and then I rose to go. You look like a jockey, said the lady. Are you a jockey? I was a fairly well-known jockey years ago, I made reply. Oh, interesting, she crushed. Won't you tell me your name? With pleasure, madame. My name is Bernard Dillon. And he got up and left the hotel. And I think the reason I just read that bit out, because that was very much at the twilight of Bernard's life, where his time as, as a jockey, a famous jockey, was dwindling. The name was still there, but the the features and the reputation that he once had as this charismatic writer was, was Noah's living, if you like. And you know, I'm not going to go into it anymore, I'm going to leave it at that because, and I would say, look, there's people here tonight that horse racing won't be no problem to them, they'll read it in the drop of a hat, but for those who don't like horse racing, stick with it because I can assure you it's not just a horse racing book. There is, there is so much, as a tragic love story goes right through this, this book as well, and it's well worth persevering with it if, if, if racing isn't your, your game. So. Once again, thanks to everybody here on my left especially and everybody in front of me. You've been fantastic to turn up tonight. You've made this night and I'm delighted to welcome Barna back with me.